Favoritism is often an unspoken problem with unspoken hurts. Join us for this important conversation today on Family Vision. Well, we're going to continue our conversation on favoritism, but before we get there, a couple of more questions for you, sweetheart, on your favorites. Why is it always my favorites? Why not your favorites? I should ask you. What is your favorite movie? Singular movie or genre or series? I don't know. Whatever. Whatever you want to say. Can we exclude the Star Wars series because that Please automatically do. is no, no, no. <laughs> because that's automatically number one. So it's really what's my second favorite? Sure. I don't even know. So what would you say? <laughs> I would put, I'm going to well, go. Well, let me guess. Gladiator. Top Braveheart. 10. Braveheart. Top 70. Top 70? That's quite yeah. a big leap. I've got a list. <laughs> okay. But no, Lord right. of the Rings genre would be up there. Oh, okay, Rocky genre would be yes. up there. Yes. Rocky well, one through four. There's a drop off after four. Uh, yes. Because they course. were into the money making. Okay. Right. Um, how about a favorite trip that you didn't answer the question on favorite movie? Oh, I don't need to. You did. That's Fine. good. Favorite trip. <laughs> favorite Back to trip. You. Oh, gosh. That's really hard. Out West trip with the whole family for sure. That was epic. COVID epic, summer. Epic. Out West trip. Yeah, you probably shouldn't mention it's COVID summer because a lot of people. What, are we going to get arrested? Are they're they still offense, arresting people now for that? I think that? they're offended by that. But yes, we camped. So I that should be a trip. that should be legitimate in a COVID world. But yes, it was really good. I loved that one. All right. That's a good choice. All right. Okay. Favorite things are great. Mm-hmm. But if we play favorites in our families, not so great. I want us to start off by talking about a myth or a misunderstanding about this sin of partiality or playing favorites. It doesn't mean treating all your kids all the same all the time. A parent asked me at a recent visionary parenting conference. She said, my teenager's getting angry at me because she says that I'm not disciplining her younger sister the way I disciplined her. So my question is this mom guilty of favoritism possible that she is, but what would you say? I would say no. She's not guilty of favoritism. And this is where we have to really explain to our kids that every spot in the family has its pros and cons. I think I've had that conversation, well, I don't know, must be at least 100 times with my kids, that every spot has its pros and cons. So when I get kind of thrown that sort of accusation, like you're not treating this child the way that you treated me, I will continue the conversation and say, well, let me give you some other examples of the way this child was treated. Like, you know, you know, you, the kid has a certain view of the situation and you as a parent have a different view. So for example, you know, I would like to say, you know, well, our W didn't, you know, our W got this sort of, sort of freedom, you know, at this age, you know, and I'm not getting that freedom. Well, I'm like, well, RW was also vacuuming the whole house at age seven. When's the last <laughs> time you vacuumed the whole house? You know, So trying to get them to understand that you cannot compare in many ways because every child has a different, different role and there are pros and cons. And my other favorite phrase, which I never understood till I became a parent when I was getting my master's degree at Wheaton College. They would always say, my my psychodynamic professor would say, no child is born into the same family. And I got that concept, but I did not get it until I had my own family. Because even the difference between adding one versus adding two children, you're already different people. It's a different dynamic. It is a different family. So you're always changing these dynamics. It's a new situation. But, But in the eyes of kids, that can be perceived as favoritism. Yeah. I saw this quote online the other day. It said, once you've figured out how to parent your first kid, it's already too late. The only way to put that knowledge into practice is to have another kid. (laughs) Unfortunately, the second kid is so different from the first kid, none of the stuff you learned applies. It's a flawed system. (laughs) I thought that was fantastic. Most of us, when we think about favoritism, we focus on favoritism from parents to kids. But another way that favoritism can creep into a family system, uh, partiality, is between siblings or between cousins or the extended family. And basically, just like a clique can form at a school or in a youth group, a clique can form 
in a family. So, honey, talk about that. What can parents do if they see siblings or cousins forming like unhealthy, exclusive groups together? I think that one of the biggest mistakes we make as parents is simply not naming the elephant in the room and addressing it and talking about it with our kids. So often, let's just take this sibling example, we might see dynamics forming where we can tell, you know, the kind of classic example is that the firstborn and the third are gaining up on the one in the middle or, or something like that, or the boys against the girls. And we see it and we almost minimize it to the point that we don't really address it from the perspective of the kids that this is really impacting them. Because we can kind of see it like, oh, it's going to be a phase. We're going to get through this. But it's so helpful to address the issues directly head on with the kids to talk about it. And then you come up with strategies on how to deal with that. So, you know, in an example where you've got the three kids and two of them are, are, you know, gaining up or there's some sort of dynamic going on, how can you be intentional? How can you make sure that you're giving like specific activities for, for me, it was always this specific activity was a chore. Isn't that fun? But you know, like if I saw a relationship that was struggling, I would say, okay, well, you guys are, you know, sweeping the floor together, you know, and this is your job for the foreseeable future. And they'd be like, well, when do we stop doing it? I'm like, when you're getting along, when it's, you know, when We will do this continually until this relationship changes. That would be the goal of that activity. It's just, but really it is dealing with things directly, you know, and often in our busy families, we just don't take the time to have the direct conversations. I remember we got great advice from our friends, Rick and Carolyn, about trying to help siblings uh, build stronger relationships together as a unit to try to kind of push back against some of this click forming that can happen in families. And they gave us this example because we've got two adult children now, so we're entering that phase. But they said um, when their oldest was high school, oldest was college, sometimes they would give the oldest child $50, give the oldest child $100, say, hey, I want you to take your siblings out. I want you to take them to mini golf. I want you to buy them all ice cream and you be the one to coordinate just a sibling yeah. fun time. And I said, what a great idea, right, to give the oldest or uh, older group of kids uh, or cousins, the opportunity to invest and create some mm-hmm. of those shared um, shared memories. But dealing with, I think you're so right, honey, that, that the basic challenge here is simply to take something that's usually unspoken. Favoritism right. is rarely talked about it and just bring it out into the light, ask these tough questions, a- encourage people to share their hearts about what they're experiencing in the family because favoritism can become a generational sin. It can Mm -hmm. become a generational Mm -hmm. curse. We see this in the families of the patriarchs. You see it with Isaac and Ishmael, like we talked about in the episode last week. You see it with Jacob and Esau. And of course, it continues with Joseph and his brothers. Listen to the scriptures, Genesis 37. The entire Joseph narrative begins like this. Now, Jacob loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Mm-hmm. So it's fascinating, and this really struck me this week for the first yeah. time. The brothers didn't hate Joseph because right. of Joseph. They hated Joseph because right. they saw his their father loving Joseph more. So my point here is that there's work to do in the spiritual realm. If you see favoritism as a generational mm-hmm. pattern in your family, confessing that to the Lord, asking the Lord to break that pattern in your family. And if you experienced favoritism growing up, and mm-hmm. I think we all did to one degree or another, making the choice to forgive your parent to forgive your yeah. sibling. Time is not going to heal that wound, but an intentional choice to forgive and asking God to take away any anger, bitterness, or resentment that you have. Because if you don't go through that forgiveness process, it is likely that you're going to perpetuate that in your generation. So honey, keep talking about this maybe need for 
personal work that, that we have to do in this area of favoritism. Yes. And so far as we've talked about this issue now in our second episode, I've really emphasized that so often we're not having feelings of favoritism. But here's the harsh reality. At times, we as parents are having those issues. A lot of that can deal with uh, well, there's well, there's actually lots of different factors. One could be just a child that is difficult or going through a really difficult time. And we one of the worst feelings a mom can have is when you don't enjoy being with your child. And when the reality is that when that child is somewhere else or out of the picture, like your life is smoother, family is, you know, you know, less conflict, less difficulty. And that is painful. And it's painful to admit that even to ourselves. But it's okay. You're, you, that's the part that I think it's really hard is to just, you know, your your child can even be experiencing that tension from you. Your child can be experiencing that you're not enjoying being with them right now. And it is really okay to admit that to yourself. Admit that to God. Ask the Lord to help you to turn your heart on the towards your child. Ask him to help you. What are the other tools or resources? For example, maybe this child has a great relationship with your mother, like has a good relationship with your grandma. It is okay for grandma to step in more and spend more time with that child to give you a break or to give you space. You know, these are natural ebb and flow dynamics in a family, and they happen to all of us. You know, one of probably the most famous things I say to my girls, because when when we're in the high school years with girls, I tend to have, me and my daughters have all had more conflict in those times. And we would say to each other on a regular basis, I think I started this, I would say, you know, I'll use Lainey this time, not Lissy, but I would say, Lainey, I know you don't like me very much right now. And I I don't like you very much right now, but I love you and I'm committed to you and I'm not going anywhere. But basically, again, I'm naming the elephant in the room and the elephant in the room is that we are not getting along. And that can, again, to her feel like favorite. Acknowledging the negative emotions. Acknowledging the negative emotions. Absolutely. Um, Dealing with it directly is so helpful and also giving yourself grace. It's not... There's nothing wrong with you if you're not always having the same warm feelings toward each child. Warm feelings is not equivalent to love. You may love all your children the same, but have different times where you have more warm feelings towards one than you do the other, and that is totally okay. Amen. So helpful. One of our resources that we would love to get in your hands is our book, Healing Family Mm -hmm. Relationships practical guide, biblical principles, no magic formulas, but action steps that you can take to seek healing in your family relationships. It's in print. It's on Kindle. It's on Audible. Healing family relationships. We'd love to get that into your hands. Mm -hmm. We also want to invite you to be a part of a great online parenting conference that's coming up April 14th. This is from our partners at Christian Parenting. It is called the Every Parent Wants to Know Conference. Uh, The big title is Perfectly Imperfect Parenting. I love that phrase. 40 speakers, all critical topics, things that parents are dealing with right now, technology, sexuality, uh, family devotions, uh, discipline, siblings. This is going to be a great event, and you can get all the information. Once you register, you have two months to watch all these different videos. Uh, You can have some friends over. You can do them with a small group. But all the information about registration is on our website at visionaryfam.com slash everyparent. Visionaryfam.com slash everyparent. Live VFM events coming your way. D6 Conference, Orlando, April 10 to 12. I'll be speaking at the Heritage Christian Family Discipleship Conference uh, in Seattle, April 28th and 29th. And I already want you to be thinking about the fall. We're going to be in Dallas, Jacksonville, Nashville, uh, Chicago. And we want to see you face to face. All the information about those events is on our website, visionaryfam.com. Click on the events button. And as always, we'd love to hear from you. How is Visionary Family Ministries making a difference in your family, in your church? Maybe you've got prayer requests for your family. Send those to us at podcast at visionaryfam.com. And we're looking forward to our next time with you on Family Vision.